This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers, and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at linode.com slash JavaScript Jabber. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another My JavaScript Story. This week, we're talking to Azat Mardan. You want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Uh, do you want to just give us a brief introduction, who you are, what you do, why you're famous? Sure. I wrote 14 books on JavaScript and Node.js. Few of them become they became top sellers and uh, in the top of the search results on Amazon.com. I also founded Node University, which is uh, the most uh, the ultimate resource for Node.js and JavaScript training. And uh, besides that, I'm speaking at conferences and I'm working at Capital One, which is a Fortune 500 company. And um, I'm doing pretty well. So that's that's my brief uh, story. Awesome. And we've had you on a couple of shows. You were on React Native Radio with Nader Davit and uh, Peter Pikarczyk. Um, that was episode 33. And then you were also on JavaScript Jabber episode 230. We talked about Node at Capital One. And we also recently recorded another episode with you talking about React and its license. That's right. And thank you for having me again. Yep, that one hasn't been released yet, so I don't have a number right in front of me. Um, and I could probably figure it out, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, um, this is the show where we kind of capture people's story, um, allow people to get to know our guests and hosts a little bit better, and then just get a feel for what it's like to be a JavaScript developer. And one of the reasons that I do this is just to help people realize, hey, we're all just regular, normal people. and so, you know, it's not scary or frightening. And, you know, if, if you go out and do what we did, then, you know, you can achieve what we've achieved. So. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of kind of like inspirational stories. Yeah. From rugs to reaches. So sort of. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, yeah. But, but also I love, I love them. Yeah. People have just interesting backgrounds, you know, the, wh where people came from, how they got into programming or JavaScript or things like that. Uh, you know, some people found it early in life and other people found it later in life and we're all out there succeeding and coding and all that good stuff. So let's dig in. Uh, how did you get started programming? Yeah, so probably my story would be the most boring or at least one of the most boring of all, all other stories uh, because I, I went pretty much the traditional career path. So Software engineering and programming was like the only thing that uh, in technology, IT and tech uh, was the only thing I was doing for my professional career besides my hobbies. So I started doing my bachelor's degree in uh, what is called informatics, economics and informatics uh, back in Eastern Europe. And then I finished, finished my bachelor's degree. I've, I've learned some PHP along the way. I taught myself. PHP and some JavaScript, of course, some HTML, CSS, was doing some side projects, was doing some some simple, very simple uh, websites for money, sort of freelancing a little bit um, in addition, uh, or should I say in parallel to my other, other activities. Uh, and yeah, so basically self-taught, but I have the traditional education. Um, I remember I took classes on um, databases. We were doing the normal forms for the traditional database, the rational database. That was a good course. Um, then a couple courses on Delphi and Pascal. So pretty much traditional career path, uh, learning a little bit of computer science in the college. And then I moved to the United States where I... Uh, uh, joined the master's program. The master's program uh, was focused also on IT and technology. Uh, the, the proper name is Information Systems Technology. Uh, 
And that was that was 2005, so that was about um, what is 12, 12, 13 years, depending on when you publish this episode. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that that degree was sort of a combination between project management slash a little bit of business background, slash, such as accounting and finance, plus some um, computer science courses. I remember I was taking ASP.NET course, uh, another course on uh, C++. I failed, failed that course. Well, I didn't fail at that, <laughs> but I, I get like a B. I was expecting A because I thought I did everything brilliantly, but C is a hard language. Even one of my uh, professors, from a different professor, not this, uh, not for this course, he said, like, dude, drop out of that class. It's hard. Uh, he he himself was studying in, uh, in our college and uh, he, he dropped out himself because he wanted A's. And um, I'm like, no, I will take it. And then I, I got B minus or C or something like that. Yeah, that was rough. After that, I tried to avoid C. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> in college Seriously? i kind of liked c yeah yeah I, it's it's very powerful and yeah. uh it's clean because it goes straight to the compiler you get the binary code there is no browsers there's no html css there's no such it's, it's just one environment right yeah so and and uh, it's also kind of all those computer science courses such as um Data algorithms and data structures, uh, they're good for C and Java, right? Not yeah. so much for JavaScript because in JavaScript we don't have vectors, we don't have lists, arrays. Well, we do have arrays, but um, all, all those like advanced data structures, we don't have them in JavaScript. So uh, I was studying, doing my master's, and uh, I was uh, working in parallel. I was building websites for uh, embassies for uh, so different countries they have embassies in washington dc that's where i lived and uh they all need a, a website right uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the the richer the country the more money they have so this small digital agency the the dev shop uh, it was focusing on building those websites and doing a few other websites as well such as we did one website for a bank uh, so mostly php html css a little bit of flash uh, lots of javascript of course and um yeah small shop kind of a startup so that was a good uh, good um experience for me after that i joined the fdic which is a federal deposit insurance corporation and uh, there I worked on different projects. Uh, so as a consultant in Washington, D.C., typically you, uh, they move you every six, uh, eight, 12 months, they move you to different projects just because of budgets and different priorities. So that's the nature of the work. And uh, oftentimes I would get code which has no documentation. It has no testing. Uh, definitely multiple people worked on it at different time. And it's just a mess, right? And um, sometimes I would make it better. Sometimes I would add to that mess, right? But that's that's the nature of the work. And it taught me how to read the source code, and uh, it also taught me how to um, how to learn fast a new technology. I worked with Visual Basic, with uh, uh, with Java, with I even wrote uh, brought a few COBOL store procedures for DB2. So that was an uh, interesting learning experience, but definitely I wasn't building a career. I was, I think at that level, I progressed to a senior developer. So I was able to, to kind of uh, teach myself and um, reason about different aspects. But uh, it's, it's not a career when you're always changing a stack, when you're always changing, you know, changing uh, technology, you don't have enough time to focus. So that's why... My main advice to people uh, who are just coming to programming and to IT, to tech industry, just focus. Maybe it's Angular, maybe it's React, maybe it's Node.js, maybe it's Ruby on Rails. Just focus on one thing and give yourself enough time, maybe a year, maybe three years until you are comfortable or maybe you and, until you master that technology and only then move to the next uh, shiny thing. So I, I realized that, um, but still I was living in Washington DC. I moved to NIH, which is Institute, National Institutes of Health. Uh, at NIH, there was a very cool project and back in the day, 
JavaScript was still considered like a laughing language, like a like a toy language, right? But I, I saw a potential. I saw that it's a, it's an interesting language, and uh, you can do pretty much anything with, which you can do with uh, like C or C plus plus. You can have like observer patterns, and you can uh, create classes and things like that uh, on that particular application. It was um, Genome Map Viewer, so it was basically like Google Map Google Maps for Genome. It's a browser application single page application which we call now and uh, you can zoom in zoom out uh, you can select different things so i'm like wow this is pretty cool because most of the times before we were just building um traditional applications we were building thick servers where you have the server side html generated and uh, you didn't have much javascript on the browser so this was like the real eye opening for me i'm like wow this is interesting and then uh, after an age i'm like okay Enough government work, and I, I want to um, I want to some to do something riskier, something more exciting. So I joined a startup. I was a founder of that startup, and I moved to California, in the heart of the Silicon Valley. Uh, I moved to Mountain View, and our startup was accepted to the 500 Startups Business Accelerator. If some of your listeners haven't heard about 500 startups. Um, it's uh, considered one of the maybe top 10 business incubators, maybe not as prestigious as Y Combinator, but definitely somewhere along the top 10 or top 15 business incubators. And what they do, they take very early startups, sometimes it's just an idea, and uh, they give a little bit of money, maybe $50,000, uh, back in our day in 2011, it was $50,000. Now I think they increased it to $150,000. And they, uh, in exchange, they provide you with mentorship and um, they, they take a little bit of equity from your uh, basically non-existent business because if it's just an idea, it's not a real business, right? So for us, it was a really good deal because we were um, even even before an idea, we were just just like slightly close to an idea stage. And um, and and there I saw that, holy cow, everyone uses Macs and everyone writes on Ruby on Rails. Uh -huh. uh, and I was a PHP developer working on Windows. In the whole batch of 30 startups, and on average in a startup, there is like two, two or four people. So we're talking about 100 people. So out of 100 people, the, they were mostly Ruby on Rails and working on Macs, and that was PHP. And maybe there was there there was another guy who who worked on PHP. So two of us working on Windows at PHP. So I'm like, okay, so I need to peer pressure definitely affected me. So I'm like, okay, so I need to to learn this Ruby on, on Rails thing if I want to uh, succeed and make my startup fast. Yeah, because that's what everyone is using, right? Uh -huh. So. And then, like Ruby on Rails is the people who develop, they use Macs, right? Uh, people like DHH and um, 37 Signals, which is Basecamp now. Uh -huh. So they use Macs. So if they develop a gem, which is a Ruby on Rails module, then the first thing they, they do, they develop it for Macs and Macs uh, runs on Linux. So it's mostly compatible with Linux, but uh, there are more Linux developers as well using Ruby on Rails. So they would test it, right? But then Windows is like an afterthought. Not not many of those developers, of course, <laughs> developers they use Windows. <laughs> and so basically, I'm like, okay, so if I want to use the cutting edge modules, if I want to use the cutting edge technology, I just have to I have to to bite the bullet, right? And um, that's what I did, and I pretty quickly adapted to Mac, and I love it since then. Switch from Android to uh, iPhone as well, just because. It's it's better to have everything um, synchronized with one technology, with one uh, provider. And I learned Ruby on Rails. I taught myself Ruby on Rails. So I, I've considered myself senior developer. In Washington, D.C., I was, I was thinking of myself as pretty strong senior developer. I came to Mountain View surrounded by smart startuppers, smart developers who quit their jobs and joined uh, the startup, started the startup, lots of smart people. Uh, brilliant engineers, software engineers, and I realized I'm not a senior developer. It's like I know very little, and uh, I need to roll up the sleeves and uh, learn some some new tricks. So I was learning. I was teaching myself and learning Ruby on Rails, AWS, Rackspace, uh, Heroku, Git. So a lot of technologies. 
And that that was a very crude awakening for me. That was pretty rough, kind of like a um, wake up call that, yeah, location matters, location matters. We have internet, so you might think like, hey, uh, Bruggen Rails has a website, there, is, there are books, you can buy books, but for some reason, being in Washington, D.C., I, um, I wasn't pressured, and there was not such um, so many good examples and so much peer pressure, I guess, and s- as much motivation as, in, as being in the Silicon Valley, where you have a lot of meetups, you have... Uh, conferences, uh, certain classes, you you have just chit chat in a coffee shop, just a random chit chat about technology. So it's great. It's great. Uh, since then, I'm, I'm living here in the Bay Area. So it's funny. But yeah, location still matters. It's, um, it matters a lot, at least for me, maybe there are some people who, who can do it just reading hacker news, and they have enough motivation for me, I needed that kick kick in the butt. Uh, to be in the Silicon Valley to learn something new. And fast forward from that startup, basically, uh, Ruby on Rails was mature at that stage. It was version three. And uh, I wanted to kind of make a make a splash, so, so, so to say, in the technology to contribute to open source, maybe um, to, to make a name, to make a career for myself, right? So I, I looked at a newer technology, and Node.js was just coming up. It was very controversial. People were still laughing at JavaScript, like, hey, <laughs> JavaScript on the server, really. Uh, all those error exceptions and uh, all those bugs and all those memory leaks. I looked at Node.js, and it made total sense to me because, I, hey, I knew JavaScript from, from early days, right? Uh, I had to use it for the browser. I used jQuery to make the applications and uh, it made sense to me. On the browser, I was using Backbone and uh, Backbone, it's a MVC framework, totally, totally fine framework. It uh, organizes my code and then on the back end, hey, I can use JavaScript as well. And then I learned this um, database called MongoDB, which plays very nicely with Mo- with Node.js. And what what is the best way to, to learn is to teach others, right? So I right right after I learned uh, just the basics, just enough for me to build a simple hello world server. Right after that, I decided to organize a class on Node.js just for engineers like me. So two day intensive class, Saturday and Sunday. I uh, I approached uh, I approached a company started monthly, which were running events in the Silicon Valley. So they, they helped me with marketing and uh, with the space. And uh, I started teaching those classes barely knowing enough. But I knew a couple steps. I was a couple steps ahead of uh, some other people. So there was value for them. There was a huge value for me as well in teaching those classes. And uh, from those trainings, I came up with a manual. And that manual became my first book uh, called Rapid Prototyping with Jazz. And now it's uh-huh. published under another title, Full Stack JavaScript. Uh, uh, can you I just... stop you here for a minute? Yeah. Um, you, you've kind of been talking for a little while, and I, I kind of want to just uh, back up uh, for a minute. And first of all, um, what was it about JavaScript that really clicked for you? I mean, you've done all these things with like genomes and, um, you know, in Silicon Valley, you know, working for some of these bigger companies, um, you know, and you've, you've done all of these different things, Ruby on Rails. I mean, what made you settle on JavaScript? What was it that got your attention? Early on, I just had to use it and I didn't like it. Um, if we take 2006, 2007, the, we didn't have dev tools. We didn't have good um, debugging. Um, it was a mess. You had to put alert boxes. So I, I barely tolerated it just to make my application work. But some applications, they were purely front end, such as this genome browser. Another application I worked on, it's called ED, which is an um, electronic calculator for the um, FDIC to, to calculate your deposits. So they don't want to, uh, people to freak out that uh, FDIC take their information. So the application is purely front end. There is no back end, there is no database for privacy issues to, to keep that information kind of like away from the government. So so that's that's an interesting concept, right? You can build entire 
application just in the browser, right? And um, once I saw Node.js, which allowed me to use the same language on the server, it just clicked. It just clicked immediately. And of course, I, I had a few people recommend, a few people who already uh, built a few applications, a um, few services using Node.js. They told me, hey, just just use Node.js and uh, you you can have one language and it's fast and it's good. And I'm like, okay, I'll give it a try. And then after that, I built a few a few of my services on Node.js and I'm like, yeah, this this thing has a potential. And then, of course, Backbone, Angular came up, then React. So from that on in the front end, JavaScript just kept growing and growing. I, so, yeah, it's a hard question. I don't know. Maybe it's uh, expressiveness. Expressiveness, definitely. When you look at JavaScript code, you see, you can understand what is happening, right? It's not like Perl. It's not like um, Python, where you have the, the indentation. In Perl, it's more cryptic. In Ruby on Rails, it's also a little bit of cryptic. You have those uh, weird uh, columns and you have uh, weird symbols. So it wasn't as obvious as just looking at um, the code itself. Uh, I often joke, JavaScript is the only language that developers think they shouldn't learn. And that's why they make a lot of mistakes. So there's definitely some hidden uh, quirks, some hidden bad parts in JavaScript just left there by design because JavaScript has to be backwards compatible. But for the most part, JavaScript is very expressive, it's very nice. If if we look at the history of JavaScript, it was made for non-developers. It would it was intentionally made to be easy to use and read for for good or worse. So that attracted me. And uh, also, I, I really, really dislike, maybe even hate. Yeah, I think hate is the appropriate word. I hate compiling languages because there is uh, the feedback loop is very, very long. I have to wait maybe three minutes, maybe five minutes before I see an error, right? Mm -hmm. If there is an error, um, I, I need to click and test my application to, to get, uh, to test the behavior. In JavaScript, it's, it's almost immediate. I save the file, go to the browser, refresh it, boom. I can see if there is an issue. With Node.js, similar thing, it's interpreted. Python, it's also interpreted, right? So Python is also good in that sense. Um, so I like, I like to have that short feedback loop. It, uh, I, I recently read a book. Uh, it's called The Talent Code. It's a really nice book, especially for someone who raises uh, kids. If they want to make them like a Mozart or um, the new golf champions. So in that book, they tell about uh, a short feedback loop. The shorter the feedback loop, the faster the learning. Because you can um, quicker adjust and quicker modify your previous behavior when you see that error. So, so I like that. I like that a lot in JavaScript. Well, on the last uh, JavaScript Jabber episode that we had you on, we were talking about React. Um, I'm curious, what what led you to React? What what was it that got you on on that bandwagon or you know in that camp? Oh yes, React. That's uh, I almost actually was ready to give up on the front end development. I was so fed up with having to deal with HTML, CSS, different libraries such as jQuery and uh, Backbone, Backbone was good, but you still you still have to write a lot of boilerplate code. Uh, you would create a model, then extend it, create a view, extend it. So in a way, you, were, you would have to create your own framework if you use Backbone. And yeah, just a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving things. It's not as clean as the back end. So I almost was ready to give up on the front end. And then I went to a conference and like to half of the conference is about React. I'm like, this is really interesting. This is really like a change in, um, um, I, I wouldn't say a cult, but it definitely seemed like a cult uh -huh. back then. Uh, it, uh, yeah, people were fanatical, React, this, React, that. So yeah. And then I'm, I started looking into that. And at first it looked, uh, React looked really weird to me because it has, a, it has HTML inside of JavaScript. I'm like, really? Uh, but then it totally made sense because it's actually not HTML. 
It's this little language called JSX, which actually converts into JavaScript. And uh, when once I start digging deeper, and uh, again, I use this approach. Teach something. If you want to learn, teach something this technology because you have to master it if you if you uh, want to teach it properly, right? So I created an online course. And for me to create that online course, I had to learn React. So I was learning. I was creating a few example applications. And it totally made sense. It's, it, it was like a, a breath of fresh air. It was so good. It was so nice to work with React compared to jQuery or Backbone and jQuery, right? I never, never got into uh, Angular and Vue didn't exist back then, but React was totally good for me. And I was so happy. It was pure joy back again, coding and building those front end applications. Awesome. Uh, which contributions okay. are you most proud of uh, for the JavaScript yeah. community and the React community? Just in general or the ones that I did myself? The, the ones that you've done that you're most proud of. Oh, okay. So so in terms of Node.js, practical Node.js, I convinced my publisher to open source the book because uh, when, when I write for a publisher, the rights to the book that belong to the publisher, I cannot just give it away. So I had to convince them to publish it on GitHub. And uh, right now it has almost 3,000 stars. So... I consider that to be a good contribution because uh, beginners can go there and start learning Node.js. It's all on GitHub. In terms of React, React Quickly, uh, it's definitely a good book. Maybe some modules that are not up to date because, hey, you know, it takes time to publish a book. So things move, move, this, uh, things move fast uh, in JavaScript and React. But definitely part number one, it's about fundamentals. It's not going to go away. So um, React Quickly. We worked uh, on it for two years, uh, about 10 people from the publisher side, uh, consisting of editors. Uh, that's that's a big book, 528 pages. In terms of applications, some of the applications, especially Capital One, I cannot really talk about them. Uh, but DocuSign, DocuSign was an interesting project. We took the legacy C Sharp and .NET application and we rebuilt it on the full stack JavaScript. And if anyone uses DocuSign right now, go to DocuSign.com and uh, log in inside in the web application. That's what they would see. They would see the new DocuSign experience. And we did pretty cool things um, with Node.js and uh, JavaScript, the browser JavaScript, to optimize that application. So I'm I'm really proud of that application. Oh, nice. and one and one trivia, one funny thing. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I accidentally bumped into the list of top contributors, uh, most active contributors on GitHub. And I was really, really surprised to see myself in that list. Uh, and my number is, if I remember correctly, 239, which is, uh, some people might might think it's it's a big number. So I'm kind of like behind in the list. But then I, look, I looked who is around me and I saw uh, Paul Irish and I saw Todd Motto and I saw... Um, other people I, I know from the community of the JavaScript community. So I'm like, wow, this is a good company. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, um, the last thing that I typically ask about is what are you working on now? I'm working on my new book, which is the second edition of Practical Node.js. And in the draft form, it's all on GitHub, which I'm, I'm uh, I really like that idea. People collaborate, they make pull requests. So they kind of working on that uh, book as a community. And then, of course, APRES will take it, uh, APRES Media, they will take that draft, edit it, and they will create a proper print book for those who like the print books. I know there are a lot of people who like who still like the print books. So that's what I'm working on. And of course, Node University, keeping uh, publishing the courses. And also, uh, recently, start doing. I started to do more with React Native which I really liked, but um, there, are, there are still a few issues. So uh, I'm work, uh, I work with that component called Web, web View. So uh, it, has, it has a few bugs, so trying to, trying to figure out what I should do next, maybe convert it to the native and uh, instead of keeping, uh, keeping it in Expo. So, so those are my main things for now. Very cool. 
Well, um, before I ask you for picks, are there good places for people to uh, check out uh, what you're looking at or working on? I, mean, I don't know if you have a blog or if you're uh, an active tweeter or something else. I have two blogs. One is about web application development. It's called webapplog.com, webapplog.com. And um, it has about 200 blog posts on Node and JavaScript. So it's a good start. I also recently published a series of short lectures about Node.js. Uh, so it's basically like an audiobook. People can find it on Node University, Node.University. And of course, I have free online courses on Node.University. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get some of those picks. For you, the listeners of My JavaScript Story, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Do you have some things you want to shout out about? I recently found out about Echo.js. It seems like it's been around for a while. Uh, basically, it's like Reddit or uh, Y Combinator for JavaScript. So Echo.js.com, if I remember correctly. Awesome. Um, I'm going to jump in here with some picks. Um, so recently, uh, I get into these games on my phone, and uh, I don't know why. I mean, some... <laughs> <laughs> They're a waste of time, but, you know, it's kind of fun to just pick them and see who else is playing them. So uh, one of them is Gardenscapes, and I just got into it, you know, so I, I'm not very far into it at all, but it's been kind of fun to just fiddle with and play with. And so I'm going to pick that. And then um, I also recently uh, picked up StarCraft II again, and I've been playing with that. And um, I decided that I wanted to actually get good at it, not just kind of wing it like I normally do. And so I, I actually bought a book on how to get better at it, and it's called The Osiris Method. And uh, anyway, it's it's pretty darn good. It's got some uh, strategies for... How, how to get good at the uh, video game? Yeah. and Different game? Yeah, what it is is it's essentially, you know, here are some sequences for starting the game. And, and so it just walks you through how to practice and how to find... Uh, yeah, that, that's and actually stuff. a brilliant idea. I remember I was reading some forums and some advices like that back in the day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's sort of like programming your brain so that you can automatically do the right things um, at the right time. And, uh, you know, so you have a solid base after you get going. And of course, then there's all the strategy that comes into it, right? Because you're assuming that if you're playing like um, versus ladder games that you're going to wind up going up against somebody else who's doing the same thing. And so you build steps into your startup sequence to send troops over their way and disrupt their sequence, right? Because then they have to pause and go over to, you know, to deal with what you sent over there. So, you know, you send over a pot of Marines or something. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then they have to get back in the groove, right? Because yeah. if, if they miss some steps, then it slows them down. Anyway, so uh, fun stuff. Yeah, fun stuff. It's good. It's good to relax once in a while. Yeah, yeah, I to, do. To I do from sometimes. reality. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So those are my picks. Um, and yeah, just thanks again for coming and and talking through your story with JavaScript. Um, hopefully, people find it somewhat interesting or inspiring. Yeah, I hope so too. The I, I get the main the last. The last words is to yeah, just uh, teach others, and that's how you can master whatever thing you, you want to master and learn. And thanks for having me. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit 
C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.